So hey everyone, I'm Umar and I'll be doing my presentation over magnetocaloric materials. Um, oh. So what is a magnetocaloric material? Uh, well, we first have to understand what the magnetocaloric effect is. And so as I describe in this slide, the magnetocaloric effect is a magnetothermodynamic phenomenon in which a temperature change of some suitable material is caused by exposing the material to a changing magnetic field. And so this is also sometimes referred to as adiabatic demagnetization. And so to go more into the magnetocaloric effect, uh, we have to understand the refrigeration process. So essentially, if we have a decrease in the strength of some uh, externally applied magnetic field, which allows the magnetic domains of um, our material to become disoriented from the magnetic field, um, by basically uh, the thermal energy present in the in the material, then uh, we'll, we'll get some uh, some cooling effects. So, um, if the material is isolated, so there's no energy that's allowed to be uh, that's allowed to go into that material. So, like that, that's what it means by it, uh, to be adiabatic. Um, then the temperature drops uh, as the domain uh, absorbs the thermal energy. Uh, to perform the reorientation of these magnetic domains. And so this randomization of these domains occurs uh, in a similar fashion to how the randomization would occur at uh, the Curry temperature of, of some ferromagnetic material. And um, so I, I have this equation here that kind of shows how, um, you know, the, the change of that adiabatic uh, temperature. And so this, the, the, this uh, equation actually shows that the magnetic caloric effect can be enhanced by a larger magnetic field variation, uh, magnetic uh, a magnet with large changes in net magnetization versus its temperature uh, at some constant field, and also if your magnet just has a small heat capacity. Um, it's also been observed that magnetic caloric effect is greatest near the material's Curry temperature, and that's because when the mag uh, magnetic material is, uh, or sorry, when the magnetic ordering uh, coincides with the structural change affected by the field, uh, there's an additional heat that's uh, either released or absorbed, which uh, strongly enhances your magnetic uh, caloric effect. So choosing the right magnet with the right like, uh, Curry temperature is, is important for depending on um, basically what temperature you're aiming for. And so some examples of these magnetic, uh, magnetocaloric materials is uh, you have gadolinium and a lot of its alloys. Uh, it, it, that this uh, element in particular seems to be uh, seems to have very good magne uh, magnetocaloric effects. Um, and there's a bunch of other um, alloys that you can use that also have a strong magnetocaloric effects. And there's you can probably just search those up. There's a bunch of lists online, and a lot of these are are found experimentally from uh, from what I've read. Uh, additionally, you can also use paramagnetic salts, so like cerium magnesium nitrate, uh, ferric ammonium sulfate. Uh, the, the salt just has to be paramagnetic, and, and you can also use it. They, they all have very strong um, magnetocaloric effects to them, too. And so actually, moving on to our thermodynamic cycle, there's uh, four important steps. And it's very similar to vapor cycle refrigeration, if you know how that works. And so I have this diagram here that kind of uh, shows this whole process. Uh, but to start off with, we have adiabatic magnetization. Um, essentially, your magnetocaloric uh, material is placed in some insulated environment. And so uh, increasing the external magnetic field causes the magnetic dipoles of the atoms to align. And that'll actually decrease the uh, material's magnetic entropy and heat capacity because um, you're basically reducing the uh, degrees of freedom in your material. And so since the overall energy isn't lost, um, the total entropy, uh, and, and so your total entropy isn't actually reduced, then you have a, a net result of your material heating up. And so that goes into isomagnetic enthalpic transfer, which just means that uh, this added heat that we get from our magnet 
we can remove by some heat sink. So typically a fluid or a gas. Um, most commonly I, I've seen is, is liquid helium. Um, just for uh, a lot of refrigeration or even just experimentally. Um, but yeah, so the magnetic field is held constant to prevent the dipoles from reabsorbing any heat. Uh, and then once it's, it's cooled, usually to the same temperature as your heat sink, or at least pretty close, then the uh, magno magnetocaloric uh, material and your heat sink are, are separated. And then we go into adiabatic demagnetization, which is the actual cooling step. Um, the substance is basically returned to another insulated condition, um, adiabatic condition, so that, that the total entropy remains constant. Um, however, during this time, the magnetic field is decreased, and um, I'll, I guess I'll get into that more later, but the thermal energy causes the magnetic moments to overcome the field, and so the sample actually starts cooling. Uh, and then you have, the, uh, you have energy that transfers from basically thermal entropy to uh, magnetic entropy, um, which is measuring the disorder of the magnetic dipoles. And then finally, you have your isomagnetic entropic transfer, which um, this is basically when the mag magnetic field is held uh, constant at some very low uh, temperature, uh, sorry, some very low magnetic field to prevent the material from reheating. And then you can actually place your material uh, in the environment that you want to be refrigerated and it'll start uh, cooling everything since it's obviously colder than its environment. And then once the refrigerant and the refrigerated environment are in thermal equilibrium, you can actually restart the cycle and, and continuously cool from there. And so actually talking about applications, we have the uh, adiabatic demagnetization uh, refrigerator, which is uh, probably one of its most common uses. And I've sort of already described all these steps, so I'll just go through it a bit faster. But we start with a, a strong magnetic field that's applied to the, to the refrigerant to align the magnetic dipoles. Then we get our heat sink to absorb the heat that's released from the refrigerant due to this loss in entropy. And then thermal contact with the heat sink is broken, so the system's uh, isolated again. And then finally, you can uh, turn off the magnetic field, which increases the heat capacity of the refrigerant and thus decreasing the temperature. Um, one thing to note is um, typically in, in practical applications, you don't turn off the um, magnetic field you'll usually slowly uh, decrease it. And this is because you usually want continuous cooling. And so um, if you're trying to cool something and make it stay at some certain temperature, you'll we'll just basically slowly cool it to make sure that it'll cool for that amount of time. And so here's an example of an ADR that's used by NASA. And so uh, there's an image of, of how, it, how it roughly looks. And it uses a salt pill which is just a pair of magnetic salts that I've uh, referred to before. And they specifically use uh, ferric ammonium sulfate. Uh, their heat sink uses uh, liquid helium. And apparently the system can last for over 30 hours before you have to go through the cycle of magnetizing it again and then uh, demagnetizing. Um, and its main use is actually to cool all the XRS detectors that um, NASA uses like in, in their, uh, just like in any of their equipment really, uh, that's in space. And so some other uses is that um, it, can, it can actually, uh, it can actually allow you to reach below one millikelvin, which I thought was just insane because that's the temperature I can't even comprehend really. And, um, also, many companies are attempting to use the magneto magnetocaloric effect in order to produce commercial fridges um, because they have a bunch of benefits over your normal fridge. Uh, they're more efficient than your normal fridge. Um, they don't use any gases or volatile liquids. Uh, they're uh, non-hazardous. Uh, they have low vibration and noise, and they also use uh, more reusable and recyclable parts compared to normal fridges. Um, however, there are some issues uh, with using magnetocaloric materials and devices, and that's mainly that they're significantly more expensive right now. A lot of the alloys 
use rare earth metals, which you can kind of guess from the name, but they, they're very expensive compared to other materials. Um, and then additionally, your applied magnetic field um, has to be very strong. And the reason this is an issue is, is because you can't just use a permanent magnet to, to get some kind some strong magnetic fields, so like two Tesla, three Tesla. You actually have to um, you know, uh, make something that can actually generate that much uh, of a magnetic field. And so uh, thanks for listening. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you. Any questions for Umar? I have a question. Um, yeah, every so often I hear about these really great talks on magnetic refrigerators, and it always seems like it's just about to be replacing regular refrigerators, but it doesn't ever seem to get there. So I know you said that, you know, the access to the materials and the high magnetic field. If the materials were readily available, would it be a commercially viable technology? Is there, is there something else missing still? Is it really just the materials in the field? I honestly think it, it might just be the materials because as, as I was doing my research on this, I wanted to see like how many, uh, I guess like companies are really investing in this. And th there seems to be quite a lot of companies. You can look up their websites and they'll say like, oh, solid state magnetic refrigerators. And it, you can kind of look into s s some of their refrigerators there. Um, I, I do think it's, it's, it's either they're still testing it to make sure it's it's good or something, or it's just still too expensive. Um, it's it's kind of hard to say for sure, but just from my I guess a, a bit of research on some of the companies, that, that that's what I can say about Thanks. it. Thanks. Yeah. So there are people still trying to get make it work. I know my um, my PhD advisor did a lot of work on rare earths, and she, she would say that um, they're not actually rare in terms of there's plenty of deposits of rare earths on Earth, but they're all in. Um, certain locations where exporting them is really hard or, or mm -hmm. accessing the deposits is really hard, so. Okay, I see, I see.